Hello and welcome to episode 93 of the Arena Regulars podcast. I'm Zach. And I'm Jeff. And we're a source for drunken Magic the Gathering arena content. That's right. Basically just two regular dudes drinking some irregular beers and talking about Magic the Gathering, in particular, the upcoming World Championship. Yeah, we got a big tournament this weekend. Uh, the biggest, you might say. Um, and the most exciting. Hey, someone's going to be the world champion for the year. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Uh, but first, each week we both bring a beer. We drink Jeff's, then drink mine, rate them on a scale of bronze to mythic, and choose the best for last. So with that, Jeff, what's on tap? Okay, this week I have something from the Second Wedge Brewing Company. Um, this is a brewing company from Ontario, from a place called St. Uxbridge. Not sure exactly where that is. I assume it's like northern Ontario, mm-hmm. or certainly north of here. Um, and I brought their flagship IPA, so this is they're called their Three Rocks IPA. It's a nice solid, like I like their can design. It's just simple, just black, and then it has some like it has three rocks and a bicycle, uh, and some like wilderness sort of uh, motif. It's all like icon iconography, I guess is is the art style. It's not like painted or anything. Yeah, it uh, it kind of looks like uh, trail markings, right? Um, so mm-hmm. I, I believe that, uh, there are a lot of trails over in Uxbridge that's possibly for mountain biking. Oh, it's Uxbridge. I was reading it as St. Uxbridge because it said like Victoria street, Uxbridge. Oh. And I, I saw this ST Uxbridge. So. Gotcha. All right. It's Uxbridge. That makes sense, yeah. <laughs> I was like, Oh, well, you know more about Ontario than I do. So sure. If that's what it's called. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know more about reading than you do. Apparently. I. I I feel like we have a lot of uh, recording that uh, proves <laughs> proves that wrong. Um, but anyway, uh, before we get into anything, we have some magic news. If you don't know, Post Malone plays magic. Um, it's it's the new... It's hard not to know by now. Yeah, I'd be surprised <laughs> if you don't know that. Um, anyway, there is a secret layer that came out which wasn't going to affect Arena, except for there is a Post Malone concert event on Arena where it was similar to like a midweek magic, but I guess Post Malone, I don't think he made these decks, but it was a historic brawl event. There were like five or so pre-constructed historic brawl decks. You could play them for free. Every win that you get, you get a different card sleeve. It was kind of nice. And I actually enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, Just playing a format I don't play all the time. I didn't have to put any effort into it. But uh, it was fun. I I had I liked it. So, sweet. Okay. I'm I'm happy with Post Malone coming onto Arena. Yeah, I really like the idea of doing the pre-con decks with a format like Historic Brawl. Like, the idea is to get people to play more Brawl. Um, It's such a tall order to build your own Brawl deck if you don't play Brawl. And you're likely to just get blown out of the water by anyone who does play Brawl. So I think this was, like, a perfect event for pre-cons. And I'm going to have to disagree with you. I think these absolutely were fine-tuned by Post Malone himself, (laughs) built from the ground up. Every (laughs) card selection had a reason um, I'm sure it will be detailed in a new song, the uh, deck creation process. So I'm mm. looking forward to that. One. Actually, I'm pretty sure he does have a, uh, a concert slash live album that is him singing all the cards. Uh, each there's just the card list, um, everything in each one yeah, of the five yeah. different decks. So um, stay tuned for, for that. Sure. I know it's going to be on Arena at some point. It will be the background music of all of your matches soon. Uh. Yeah, forever. <laughs> Um, there was an arena open this last weekend as well. Alchemy, uh, just kind of popped right in there. I think that was kind of like an extra thing. I feel like we talked about it a while ago. So, I, cause I remember when I saw it happening, I was like, oh yeah, I have a memory in my head of this being a thing, but because I'm not really interested, like I have too many other formats I'm interested at the moment. So alchemy has fallen by the wayside for me personally. So this one fell off my radar right along with it yeah uh there is one that i am excited for though in a couple weeks november 5th and 6th is going to be the arena open for dominaria united sealed interesting to come back to sealed right before we move on to the brothers war uh, i think is the the pre-release for that will be the weekend after so interesting that that they're doing it this way 
but kind of cool. Uh, just a last ditch effort of, hey, give Dominaria United your all before we go to the next thing. I, I think it's it's nice. I don't mind it for this kind of event. Like It would be weird if the World Championship was, you know, like the weekend that the new set's supposed to drop and then it was Dominaria draft or something. Be like, why? But um, that's not what we want to see. But for an arena open where it's like, this is a good send off for the format. Maybe you played a ton of it. Now you get like as much advantage out of playing a lot of Dominaria United as possible and actually can win some money from, for being like devoted to the format. I think that's really cool. You don't have to play it if you don't want to, you're not like watching tuning in to watch it. I mean, maybe you watch a streamer play it if you're interested, but it's not like, Oh, why would you choose this old format? This feels properly like, a send off for Dominar United Limited and a really nice way to reward any player who has like put in the time and effort to get really good at Dominar Dominar United. It's also two weeks before we're going to get it on Arena, so it's not exactly right next to it, but uh, in mm-hmm. either case, uh, I'm happy with all these events. I think it's well timed. Yeah. So good job. I might not play in it because I suck at Dom- I assume I suck because I haven't played in a while. And, uh, <laughs> other people will be really good at it so uh it's still on the fence for me yeah i don't know if i have the bankroll at the moment uh and i'm trying to save up a bit before brothers war so i might not either but yeah who knows it might be a little cheeky that weekend yeah exactly but the main event is of course this weekend october 28th to the 30th is magic's 30th anniversary and the magic world championship uh we're going to talk a lot about this tournament today, so um, buckle up. Yeah, this is a great tournament. I mean, last year's was awesome. So It was the best tournament of the year last year. Like, there was nothing more yeah. exciting than the World Championship last year. Uh, I For sure. Now I'm thinking, like, is this one not going to be as good? <laughs> <laughs> so I know there were some changes from last year. We have, like, twice as many players. Mm-hmm. Um, but I still think it's going to be a great event. It's I love multi-format events. I, you know, this one was super exciting last year, should be super exciting again this year. The only, like, big question mark for me is, are they actually going to devote the proper resources to casting it, like, properly? Because I know recently we had some tournaments that were uh, less than stellar watching, viewing experience, and so I really hope that they, for at least the World Championship, are bringing their A-game on... Uh, like I hope the money from the arena championship was was moved to get better coverage of the world championship. I that's like the optimist in me is like they didn't just cut that from the budget, they moved it to the world championship. Yeah. So let's get into the world championship now because, um, well, let's kind of outline how it's going to go. So um, this weekend the the championship it's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. As normal, the, a lot of these tournaments are, are those three-day events where the Sunday is the top eight. In this case, it's going to be a top four. Um, so we're going to go through the show in the same way. So they're doing three different formats. We'll be, they'll be playing Dominaria, United Draft, and then Standard, and then Explore, with a top four being Standard. So uh, before we get into it completely, I do want to talk about the casting. I believe they're at magic 30 in las vegas this is happening there right all the players are right. are going to be physically there so they will have more control over the actual casting of the event it won't be the same hopefully it won't be the same uh internet issues and weird stuff with discord right yeah so that should fix the discord restreaming part but it it doesn't guarantee the like streamers can talk or the casters can hear uh, each other well, they'll, they'll presumably be in the same booth, but like we can hear them. Mm-hmm. There were points when the casters were laggy or they weren't coming through at all. Like if that's if that's the case, that's just the case. It doesn't matter if the casters are sitting next to each other. Or that's not. true. But yeah, that's true. That there should be there are fewer excuses for poor uh, like like latency issues and yeah. stuff like that when they're in the same room. So there will definitely be some of the errors will be cleaned up. Yeah. Um, and I don't remember that many happening at the Worlds last year, so... No, I remember it being great, so... Really crossed my fingers on this, but it is the return of, like, it's 
it's in-person magic, not t- tabletop paper magic. As far as like the actual world championship goes, it's still on arena, but they will be in the same place, which is what they wanted this to be. Uh, back when they were back when Paolo won and all that stuff, they were there physically. Yeah, those tournaments were awesome too. And there was none of this like uh, pasting one guy's screen over the hand; like you could just see it. I think so. Um, those tournaments I remember being really fun to watch, like pre-COVID big arena tournaments where they met in person, like sat at computers back to back, like an actual esport kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. I'm excited to see another tournament like that. Yeah, uh, I am as well yeah, with the fireworks and everything. We'll see if there's fireworks. Who knows? Maybe it's not in the budget. Uh, but the prize pool <laughs> is smaller than it was last year. Um, it's five hundred thousand dollars instead of last year. It was one million. They they bumped it up after all the hullabaloo of it being smaller and then all that stuff and them giving money back and all that drama. Um, this year it's five hundred thousand for twice as many people. So. I don't exactly know how that works out, but <laughs> so I think when they bumped it up last year, they were like, "Okay, but we're still bringing it down." Because the problem was last year they they tried to like secretly lower the prize pool at at the last minute. Like they announced a certain prize pool, players spent money to attend tournaments to like make it into that championship or spent their time, and then when it was time for, to announce the championship, they're like, "Oh, hey, by the way, it's going to be like a quarter million bucks," and then all the players were like, "No, you said one million, like." I don't know if I would have. I wouldn't have done it. Gone through all this effort if the prize pool was four times as small. Um, so I think that when they were like, "All right, fine, we'll give you your million, but just so you know, next year it's going to be smaller." Yeah. And then you're like, "All right, well now you know." Yeah. Which is good. <laughs> you, you can't complain that it was late. Enough. I do want to say that there had been a lot of drama about all of the different sports, like esports stuff and magic coverage, and and all of those things last year. Maybe it was because we were covering it more because we we don't talk about it nearly as much now. But is it a? It's just a breath of fresh air that we don't. It's not constant barrage of like Watsy fucking up tournaments every other weekend. I think a big part of that is like paper events coming back. That's a true. Lot of the competitive community gets to go play in like the RCQs or you know that new Pro Tour system that they've developed, and I'm sure there will be complaining when the first Pro Tour ro- run rolls around yeah but that i mean when all that started like since then everything seems pretty great and they're as transparent as we've wanted them to be and that was about six months ago Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little bit more and just i'm just i'm just feel like uh, just looking back at all that drama that i forgot about from last year this year i'm like oh my gosh there's other drama with magic 30 in general and when some with some commander stuff and the prices for the actual tickets and things but as far as the mm-hmm. the pro players are concerned in the competitive events, uh, this does. I haven't really heard a lot of terrible, horrible things. So I think of that stuff as like background drama. There's always going to be commander and price drama, and like Wizards isn't always going to do make the exact cards and the decisions that everybody wants. So that there's always background drama. Of yeah. Like oh, this is so. Expensive. Wait, is that is and, there? Uh, is, so there, you're saying there is competitive drama going on i just don't know about it because the magic 30th anniversary edition came out and everybody was talking about that is that what you're no, saying no the opposite when you're saying like there is price drama going on for magic 30th and stuff like that stuff's the bad background drama to me it's like every new set there's going to be band drama a little bit of band drama a little bit of price drama a little bit of whatever gotcha i, I tune that all out now because i'm like yeah it's just unless it's over the like you know expected margin from a new set release of people calling for things to be banned there's always at least one card uh, no that's not never other people never it's too expensive (laughs) um think of all the like all the people absolutely like uh, i would bet my my car that like omnixilis will be banned in a week it's like okay so where's that car man (laughs) what's going on i did see somebody post something about uh bootlegger stash being like hey commander folks did what's going on with this card didn't is it uh, ruining everything? Yeah, yeah. The... weren't you all complaining about it like a week ago? How it's going to totally what's... ruin the format? What's going on? Because uh, you're not actually, you don't have to be accountable for all the crazy shit you say. You just get more followers by being a crazy, like, by yelling things crazily. And then when you're wrong, it doesn't matter. It's like politics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. You just need attention. Um, because you just yeah. need to... Uh... Nobody holds you accountable for the shit you said a month ago. Okay. <laughs> 
Nobody remembers. That's the thing. <laughs> That's right. There's a new thing you're yelling about. So, like, they're distracted. Mm-hmm. And we're all just drinking too much beer. Anyway, let's get yeah. um, let's get back on track a little bit. But <clears throat> after saying how Watsi is doing all these great things, um, uh, really excited that we're having competitive limited is going to be important for the best tournament of the year. And we have two other, like two constructed formats. Last year we only had one. This is amazing. I'm really excited for this. And it's the two best ones. And it's the two best ones. Um, the one thing is that I did read somewhere that the players are drafting their decks on Thursday. And then they're playing the decks on Friday. So I don't know if we're having okay, so. coverage of the draft portion. I think, which is a little weird to me. Because that's usually the most exciting part of the draft portion. And the actual games are the things that people don't like as much. I remember for some tournament where this was a thing, they contemplated the idea of having the players draft paper cards and then play their decks on Arena. So they would sit in tables of eight and they would record it like the old school Pro Tour drafts. Draft with actual cards and then Wizards would, like, grant them that deck or whatever on their account, and they would play on Arena. I don't know if they ever ended up doing that. I think it was discussed. And then COVID hit, and it was like, oh, we're not doing in-person, in-person. tournaments anyways, so, like, whatever. But back when it was, like, <sighs> the tournament scene is moving to Arena, mm-hmm. but it's in person, that was what how they were going to handle drafts. That's... So I was, was low-key hoping that's what this was, Ooh. but it sounds like maybe... No, not. it's possible... Um, Actually, maybe that's why they're drafting the day before, because mm-hmm. then it gives them time to like set up the decks and like make sure, validate everything, yeah. make sure it's right uh, before starting the tournament. Because what I'm crossing my fingers... Now, the thing is, the, the viewer's guide doesn't say anything about the actual draft. I still think they should be recorded, and I think they should have just one table of eight that has all the cameras set up for each person's face and hand and top-down and everything. And then just have those people sit at the table that's the camera table and they draft their their decks and you just go through each pod and it's like the first round you do all eight and those people leave and go do something else. The next round of eight come in and do their draft and then you have the footage of everything and you can cut in together and tell the story about what happened the next day, at least. Mm-hmm. That should be what they're doing or something like that. Um, because having no interesting story about what happened and what the story of their decks are from the draft is that's the most exciting part. So, uh, there could be some really cool stuff going on with this. Actually. Um, I didn't think about drafting in paper. I, that is awesome. So I'm hoping that'd be pretty cool. If that would be really cool because imagine you're at magic 30 and they're like, Oh, you can go sit and be a spectator to watch the world championship draft in person. All those people at that table, like, when are you going to see that again? I guess they would have to, like, post deck lists so you, it can't be, like, one person saw that Reed Duke drafted this and, like, that leaks and then only Reed Duke's deck is known beforehand kind of thing. Oh, yeah, well, because they're... So Friday morning is when they're posting all the deck lists for the entire tournament. So right. it would be the leak of, like, people would know ahead of time, but they have open deck lists for everything anyway. So I guess if you had extra that night to prepare, um, but it is interesting to think like you get your cards and then you have the whole evening to not really build your deck, but think about it. <laughs> yeah. Realize how you misbuilt your deck is probably what I would be. You know, I'd be like, fuck, I had 20 minutes. I built this deck. And now that I'm thinking about it and looking at it, I really should have done this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I guess you know to like sideboard into the better deck every game. That's true, but go like starting O one in your matches. That's not that's not a good plan. <laughs> not ideal. Not ideal. But I mean, hey, who knows? The draft portion could not even matter at all. Like last year, where um, <laughs> not that it didn't matter. Or like the arena championship, same thing happened, right? Didn't uh, Sam lose? Like <laughs> I don't know if he O three, but he had a really bad draft. I don't know if he went O three, but he yeah, it was a bad draft. And so you, he didn't do like better than one, two. I think he might've Oh three. I I can't quite remember though, but then he just crushed the, um, alchemy. Yeah. So 
we'll have to find out. Uh, <laughs> I do love that everybody's like, yeah, more limited. I want limited in um, these competitive formats. And then all the winners are like, I don't even practice it. Don't even have to because I'm so good at the yeah, constructed format. I forgot it was a part of the, the tournament. <laughs> it is smaller. So uh, there are 14 rounds of the tournament. Uh, Friday is eight rounds. Uh, so it's three of draft and then five rounds of standard and then saturday is six rounds of explorer uh which is interesting because usually it's 15 rounds in these tournaments so i don't know why they decided to do 14 instead but they probably have a reason yeah it might be just like events like related to the the, the bigger event that's going on that's true um, timing with the, the venue and all that kind of stuff there might be something exciting happening uh, saturday night i don't know right who knows? And then we're going to do a cut to top four for Sunday, and it's double elimination. That feels a little more reasonable in the top four, though, than in the top eight. The, the whole double elimination, just, like fall to losers, battle of your way back kind of thing. It's, it's long for a top eight. Like, it's the whole day. It is the whole day. You are right that sometimes the top eight drags on, and, like, you do just watch the losing players more often, and the winning player you kind of forget about because they just, like, win in the morning, and then they just sit there. Right, and then you, which it happened to Yuta, yeah. right? Like, Yuta was just sitting there. And then, although that one is just the perfect story, because, like, Jean-Emmanuel battled all his way back. Like, I think he lost the first round or something mm-hmm. in the top eight, and then just fought the whole way back. Uh, and then I think took a match off Yuta or something, and then Yuta won. Or maybe, I think he got 2 would actually. He got 2 would yeah, in matches. Uh, but he had a... Some good games. But I, I was like, I don't even care who wins. Like, this is a great story either. Yeah, way. and I think John Emmanuel was saying the same thing in some interview I read recently, uh, where he's just like, I just got there, and that was I just wanted to play some magic, and it was great, right? Because uh, you could tell watching them last and, and year he, uh, how like he was just having yeah. a good time, and a lot of times he's like Ooh, crossing his fingers, like I don't know, is this gonna work? And then they just be like, whoops, I guess whatever. <laughs> They're both like smiling the whole time, mm-hmm. and you could tell like Jean Emmanuel was happy for you too mm-hmm. as well when he ended up winning. So yeah, it was like this tournament could not have gone better. It was so great. <laughs> I really loved it. And they're both in this tournament. So. Yeah, they really are. Um, hmm. All right, so we should get into a little bit of draft talk. Before that, drafting. Speaking of that, uh, if you are, are a long time listener of the show, you know that we used to draft players for all of the different tournaments that were happening uh every few weeks or so in our magic fantasy teams we never had a really good name for it but yeah it's sort of like a fantasy league um yeah it was, it, I, I don't know what to call yeah, it was it. a fantasy yeah. league <laughs> that was just for us and uh well we had fun we liked it uh but and, and do you remember who ended up winning? I can't even remember who ended up winning the the league, but uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't sure, matter. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Jeff won. I had to buy him a bunch of beers. Oh, I yeah. did. Right, 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 right. Yeah, because you picked Yuda with your last pick. What a good pick. yeah. What a good pick. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so we're going to do this every year just for the world championship because it's fun for us. So if you want to stick around for that, wait till the end of the episode. But if you uh, don't, just to run down, um, hey, if you don't play fantasy sports, I understand. Maybe you don't like sports very much. That's cool. I do. Jeff does. It's a lot of fun. It's a great way to be invested in something that normally you're not super invested in. So if you want to watch the championship and haven't felt very, uh, uh, I don't know, excited about it? Maybe pick five players and see if you win and you picked the right ones. It is surprisingly fun, right? (laughs) Because you just have, if you just watch a match and you pick who you want to see win at the beginning, then you have somebody to root for. And then you have, then you start rooting for them the whole tournament and then you're watching it a lot more. That's how you like sports. (laughs) Yeah, that's the way to get into a sport if you're not that into it. For real. (laughs) I've gotten into a few sports that way. Yeah, pick a team and then... uh, and then yell at the screen or the TV. That's right. That's it. It's super easy. Yeah, drink some beer. Yeah. And then steal their deck list. And then whenever a call goes against your team, go, hey, oh, oh, hey, oh, oh. Bullshit. That's fucking bullshit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of those today against the Broncos. Anyway. Sorry, the who? I, what, what team? No, not the who. I'm talking about football, not bands. Anyway. Oh, my yeah. bad. My bad. I, forgot, I forgot the Broncos were a football team. Oh, huh. Yeah, I know. So irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah. Two and five. <laughs> Anyway, 
let's talk a little bit about draft. Uh, yes. Have you been drafting a lot? I have drafted quite a bit of this uh, this set. I I feel like I've drafted a fair amount of it, but it was very front loaded. I haven't drafted it in a while, so. I know it's weird that like Wizards has gotten so good at building draft formats now that they do have metagame evolutions. It's also probably like partially a result of just the information sharing that goes on today. Mm-hmm. Um, like the metagame evolves very quickly. And so the metagame is probably not the same as when I was drafting, but I have a good handle on like all the cards and different archetypes. I don't know why, but the last few times I was playing, I kept, like, my opponent was always playing white-black. Just, like, white-black removal, <laughs> basically, with, like, reanimator stuff. And I would just run into it constantly. And I think that this format has been really interesting. I don't find it nearly as hard to get through as, like, some of the other ones we've had recently. Like, New Capena, where it's, like, you're forcing something from the very beginning uh and it doesn't feel as bomby as crimson vow did and it doesn't make me feel sad like uh midnight hunt uh <laughs> i liked midnight Hunt. i know i know you liked midnight hunt it's more so that like i don't feel like there's anything in this format where it's like you don't want to start here stay away from this thing is there are obviously cards that you don't really want to play but overall it feels very well-rounded And there are a lot of different decks that are all really interesting. And you can do a lot of different stuff. And I don't feel like I'm really pigeonholed. And a lot of it is because of the lands, of course. Which, hey, lands are super important in Magic. It's like half your deck. Not really half, but close to. Or should be. Now, there were a few things. So, back in my day of this format, you know, talking like several to a few weeks ago, I hadn't changed my i er, i was pretty early on the opinion that boros is the best deck mm-hmm. and i haven't changed it um f- from like any drafts that i've done since then when i watched the arena championship there was a strong preference toward these like multicolored decks where you take all the lands and then take everything and like you, there were some cards that i thought personally were terrible like the the vine wall the defender mm-hmm. the like the, yeah the vine wall and stuff that were valued super highly or well i mean middle of the pack but for me that was super high for uh that card now that those players didn't do well so i never like learned if that was just variants that these players who were featured for a reason because they're limited experts i don't know if they were they felt like they had a bad draft seat so they had to go for this you know i don't i don't have all the details mm-hmm. It just sort of looked like they were favoring this archetype and then they didn't do well with it. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I actually think there was a Boros drafter who 3-0'd like pretty easily <clears throat> because no one else, everyone else was like avoiding it. Um, but I also saw a preference in some of those drafts for black-white. So maybe black-white is like all the rage in the new meta kind of thing if you're running into it a lot. Yeah, because it feels... Similarly, uh, like, aggressive to the Boros deck. Um, and sometimes they will splash just for the um, the Keldon... The 3-1 that makes the 1-1s and everything gets haste. Strike. Yeah, strike team. team. Um, sometimes they have that because it's not that difficult to be able to play a card that's, like, one color pip off. And you never want to play that card as, like, a three-drop anyways. You always wanted to kick mm-hmm. it, if you could. Like, when you're playing it as a three-drop in red-white, it was sort of like a, oh, all right, I guess. I'm yeah, or you're thing. like, I, I, they missed a land drop. I need to, you know, capitalize on this. Right, this is a 3-1 haste. Like, yeah. Sure, but... Uh, so I think that um, I've seen a lot more of the white-black stuff and less of the, um, the white-red, but I think... I think part of the vine wall thing and like wanting to prioritize a lot of lands is just because obviously people want to be able to op- be open and play a bunch of different things. But also, I don't know if how much the defender deck plays into that because a lot of people are taking some of these like you, the vine wall is like u- utility where you can fix your lands and you're also waiting for your wing. The, the chaplain, wing mantle chaplain. 
So if you're like already in a place where you can play any color and then you open any card that's close to a sweet <laughs> defender card, you jump right on top of it because the amount of games that you just lose to that one fucking uncommon is absurd. Yeah, but for me, the vine wall is only something I would take if I already had a chaplain. Whereas these people were just taking it. I don't know. It feels like this card essentially just goes and gets you a land. Sure. But it's like it's so slow and, and the rest of the card does nothing. So it's not yeah, like two for one. Maybe it saves you two damage at some point or something like I don't know. This card stays. It's, <laughs> I don't think it's terrible, <laughs> but I understand that it did seem like they were valuing it fairly highly uh, in that draft. But I will play that card. And it is helpful because every once in a while you're like, I need a two drop that helps me get all my land drops because my big spells are really important and I have to be able to cast them on time. That's why I like it. And it blocks. So it saves you some damage at some point. So I don't think it's terrible. I've never played it and was always happy when my opponent played it. And to me, that means it's a bad card. But obviously, like the players who were picking it are better than me. So there's something I'm overlooking. Yes. But in my in my style, it's like, I don't know why people are taking this card. Um, but I always felt that white was the best color. And that's part of why red-white was so strong. So black-white being strong also doesn't... Like, I, I also liked black-white when I was drafting. And I wonder if black-white, on top of what you're saying, that it, it has the... Some similar aggressive components where it can get under some of these multicolor dirtle decks. I wonder if it's also just good against red white, and so that like warps the metagame in this weird way where like sure maybe red white's the best against most things, but then black white is also good against those things, but just really good against like better in the that matchup. Right? That's the thing that the dynamic that often happens that sort of shifts what the quote unquote best deck is because. Everyone knows there's a best deck, but then this deck beats it and also is good. It's like second best otherwise. Can still go under the, the dirty makes ones. it the best yeah. deck. Yeah. The other thing is that, because um, I think green is really good because it has a bunch of the fixing for all the, the off-color kicker stuff you want to do, but domain is super strong because of Mirror's Outrider, the the five mana, four, four red card that just domes mm -hmm. them for five lava axes the shit out of them and then you just attack for four um which is just the best and um what is and then it randomly has reach because yeah. like yeah this card also needed reach so that you didn't lose to flyers. it has a bow like, this card didn't need reach yeah guys. it did I mean, it's so good um <laughs> so that card and then you're also playing um all the pump spells that are awesome because this draft format has sweet pump spells and you can win the game out of nowhere <laughs> it's awesome yeah. you can spend one green mana to give your creature plus five plus five sometimes oh amazing why would i do that when i could give seven creatures plus two plus one and trample yeah because th this way you, you attack and your opponent's like i don't know they have a couple whatever i just won't block and then you kill them <laughs> so much better <laughs> either that or this way kills them if they don't block too. Yeah. <laughs> maybe that's why you don't like the um the vine wall just because like you just go around it all the time but if you have something bigger it's like this fucking it, chump yeah it never stops yeah. me <laughs> <laughs> i'm like oh no it blocked a one one what am i gonna do <laughs> i'll incidentally kill it with the pump spell i was gonna play anyway yeah <laughs> <laughs> and trample over it by the way just for an extra damage like <laughs> yeah i just always get in the situation where i would ha like value that card so highly heroic uh whatever it is yeah you take it late or like mid like it's just i think yeah the, the amount of time you want at least uh, yes. one, so you have to value it somewhat highly but you don't have to take it early well, the, it's one of those weird cards the like, amount of times where it's like pack two pick 10 and i'm like okay it's time to pick this i take it next pack there it is i'm like all right well i could have had another i don't know maybe not a two drop but some other creature that is like, ow, oh, I just wish I had more creatures in my deck. Damn it. I, I think that's, it's just my own emotional thing. But if you didn't take it, that, that it wasn't coming in the next Classic. Pack, and then you'd be without one and you'd be like, my deck stinks. Yeah. So, <laughs> so frustrating. Um, but anyway, 
I've just been having a lot of fun with this. And uh, I think the, the t- like clear two color archetypes doesn't feel as solid because most of the time, like everyone has dual lands and anything can be coming from your opponent on most turns. You're just like, it could be a lot yeah. of stuff. I don't really know um, what's going to happen, which makes the keeps it really fun for me. I don't know. If people feel like that's really good or not, I stand by the off kick, off color kicker being awesome mm. because it's still like so interesting. Of oh, I, maybe I just have a two color deck and I have a few lands. Like, do I want to splash for a kicker ability mm-hmm. or not? Like, yes or no. Maybe I have a couple kicker in blue and one kicker in red, and I'm like white black. Like, what do I splash? Is it worth it to play a tapped land versus just having better mana that comes into play untapped? Um, just for the possibility of kicking this card at some point, how powerful is that kicker? Like, all of these things are just super interesting questions that are happening during gameplay and also during the draft mm-hmm. and like deck building portion. And early on, I was like, "This is awesome," and I don't think that's worn off as just being a really cool part of the. It it really like, hasn't. It's still interesting all the time. And I think they did a really good job with the hard to cast uh, gold cards where it's like two pips of uh, mm-hmm. one color and one pip of the other color, uh, because it actually is really difficult to cast them sometimes. Where you're like, man, I really want right. this in my deck, but I just don't know if it's going to fit, or I didn't build my mana base right, as opposed to when we have hard-to-cast cards in like Ravnica sets, where you're like, well, it's it's two colors of yeah. each of my colors, so I'll be able to cast it at some point kind of thing. Um, where, right. Y- or sets with like just treasure tokens are everywhere, and you're like, oh, it doesn't really matter. It's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. No. So, yeah. I, I've been happy with all that. So I'm really excited to see what these pro players do. And if you're right, if Boros ends up being the best, and people continue to just like not talk about it, <laughs> they're like, wow, these you gruel aggro domain is going to be the best because I hear love, people love that deck, and uh, <laughs> uh, it's just like we'll we'll have to find out. But um, I don't know. It feels so much better to not have to attack my opponent and just dome them for five with Miri's Outrider. And then when they kill it, you bring it back and dome them again. The thing is, Miri's Outrider is totally fine if, if it's hitting them for two on when it comes into play, and sometimes three. Like, that's still totally reasonable. It doesn't have to <laughs> doesn't do have five. You have to dome them for five. A 4 4 reach that deals three damage on ETB is like a great limited card. It's, so. That's true. You're right. But. It's fantastic when it does five. I always see people like holding on to them and like trying to get all five lands, mm, 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 and playing mm. it in only domain decks. Like I put this in almost any red deck because hitting them for two, I guess any aggressive ish red deck. Cause that's when hitting them for, that's when like doming them is valuable. Yeah. Well, it just makes me, cause like a lot of, for less, a lot of times I'm playing it against, uh, with the, um, Phyrexian rebirth. What's that card? The one that you just like raise dead. Uh, for one black mana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, whatever it's called. Um, but then you, the kicker's green. Um, where you play your, your Miri's Outrider, and they're like, oh, I'm going to kill that because I can't deal with a 4-4 right now. You're like, thank you. Now I can pick it up and play it again and kill you without attacking. <laughs> like, that was the best. Yeah, I haven't had that. I haven't had the luxury of uh, such a play. So, Usually I attack with my Miri's Outrider like a mm, chump. Yeah. Win the game that way. Well, you can do both. You can play it and attack, and then they trade with it, and then you pick it up again and play it again. Feels good. Um, anyway, Jeff, we should probably move on, but before we go, uh, what do you... I know what you would do if you were playing, but what do you think the pros are going to do? What's going to be the the kind of archetype or the deck that you're like, yep, I was expecting a lot of people to try to target this and and kind of force their way into that archetype yeah i think it's interesting because i do think boros is the best um but i don't think it can support that many drafters right like it's not so good there are some formats where it's like oh green black is the best and the cards are so deep that oh, okay there's no format where green black is the best, but like green <laughs> blue black is the there best. you go and the, the the cards are so deep that like four people can draft it i think midnight hunt was a bit like that um like white blue was the best deck but blue black was second best and could support like three drafters at the table so blue black was everywhere um i think if there's two red white drafters their decks are fine and if there's 
any more than that, it you're not going to end up with anything good. So I suspect that it's going to sort of revolve around that, and it's this weird thing where, okay, the aggro deck's really good, so you don't necessarily want to commit to a slow, dirtly deck, but you're not sure people are going to get the aggro deck. Mm-hmm. And so if they're just mid-range, then the Dirtly deck goes over the top. And maybe that's what we were seeing in the Arena Championship. Um, Because these players are the best in the world, that means they get a little more mileage out of slower decks. Like, this is just a thing. Um, The more turns that you play, if you're a better player, then the more likely it is you essentially are going to win. You get to leverage your skills in a longer game more and so these better players will tend to prefer slower decks so i'm gonna say that uh we're gonna see a similar thing to the arena championship where we're seeing players really value staying open by taking lands and then they're gonna end up backdooring into these multicolored domain decks because they made that their priority to stay open Mm -hmm. because some of the best decks you only can really go for them if, if, if the seat is there. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. I think that people are going to stay open and the players that know when to... The player that can do the best at uh, picking the lands at the perfect moments will be the, 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 the best players. The ones that can um, know when they have to sit back and which lands are the ones that they need for their deck. Not just any land, but of course... I think the green ones uh, are valued less because you would rather put a forest in your deck uh, for fixing and you would, as opposed to just like an island or something. Um, Mm -hmm. So I I just think that they'll do better at that. But ultimately, I think the player that opens Shieldred will do uh, the best. I think whoever, I would force Boros knowing that other people are going to be a bit timid to jump into it and then probably be the only Boros drafter at the table and just crush everyone with these stupid dirtly decks and their their fine walls yeah. that I don't care <laughs> Perfect. All right, well, Jeff, I think we went a little bit longer on... Calling it now, someone three O's with Boros. Okay, we'll see. And then I'm going to call someone will O3 with uh, a domain deck. <laughs> Um, so someone will owe three with a bunch of money. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, Jeff, I think uh, we should go on a beer break before we talk about the other formats and then draft our players. This beer break is brought to you by our patrons over on Patreon. That's right. You're already supporting the show just by listening, but if you want to support the show even more, well, the Patreon is the best way to do that. Plus, you get to draft your favorite co-host uh, by buying me a beer. There should be a big old button there that says buy Jeff a beer. Or by buying me a beer. And there's just a regular button that says buy Zach a beer. So go to patreon.com slash arena regulars to see how big the buttons really are. Or if you really want to send us your draft teams and inform us about how much better you did than we did, you can do that on our Discord. Join the Arena Regulars Discord channel. The link should be in the show notes. All right. I'm excited for this one. Mm-hmm. I have been trying to get one of these beers in your hand for a while. Not saying that uh, they're amazing and they're the best ever, but I was just surprised they didn't deliver to your house. So I'm happy that I was able to get some in your fridge. Yes, I appreciate that. Zach drove them out to Hamilton for me since I no longer live in Toronto. And uh, mascot was like, we're not going to drive them out to you. In the yeah. Middle of nowhere. Uh. <laughs> so uh, the beer I brought today is called Mondo from Mascot Brewery. It's their West Coast Session IPA. It's 4.5%. And it, use Col- it uses Columbus, Centennial, and Amarillo hops. Uh, yeah, this is just a spot that's um, close to where I live. Very close. And also they have another spot in Toronto. But I don't know why they wouldn't bring anything to Hamilton. It's only like an hour away. It's not that big a deal. But whatever. I think I was just outside their radius, essentially. Maybe yeah. uh, maybe their owners don't like Hamilton for some reason. Yeah, like, whatever. No, cut it off there. Yeah, cut it off. Uh, but for the next few weeks or so, whenever we're doing our beers, we actually have ones from both of these breweries, Mascot and Second Wedge. So we're kind of pitting them against each other. This is Mascot's IPA against Second Wedge's. So we kind of... We might be picking the best brewery at the end. We'll find out. You can stay tuned. Yeah, let's see. All righty. 
Let's get into some standard. So basically, the thing with standard is that black midrange decks were everywhere, so they banned the Meat Hook Massacre. And now, black midrange decks are everywhere. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. It uh, didn't have a huge impact. I know people were kind of talking about, we included, and I still think this, uh, that uh, it, it does open up decks that can go a bit faster. But I don't know if what you want to do right now in standard is try to go under the other decks because they're gonna gain a bunch of life or they're gonna they're gonna drop a wandering emperor and exile your creatures and gain life or a shieldred that will block all your stuff that you can't get around and gain a bunch of life. So uh you might have to go over top, which is not something I'm really great at, or my specialty is <laughs> going over the top of another deck. The thing that I'm really interested in standard about for this tournament is whether these players had any advance notice about the Meat Hook Massacre ban, because that was only two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Was it two weeks ago? Two weeks ago, right? Yeah. So they did most of their practice with a different format like it's 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 con totally conceivable that they would say okay i'll practice standard and then i'll practice explorer and then right before the event i'll practice draft and that'll be like my split so they might have concluded their standard practice before the ban announcement i i do wonder because a lot of the time um do you have teams when you're doing this type of stuff i know um Reed Duke is... Uh, right, because it's so hard to split. Like, it's so hard to practice all three events yourself. Exactly. All three formats, yeah. Um, so you want to be yes, able to, to split up the different formats to different people that are kind of um, focused on those types of things. So I know Reed Duke is uh, partners with his cousin, as well as a, a few other players. And basically, they want to, to come into the tournament being like, all right, you guys focus on playing as much Explorer as possible and find out which deck we should play. We will trust you. That's why you're our teammate. I'm going to focus on standard with this person. We're going to try to figure out what deck we should play for that. And then we'll post everything that we do and all that stuff, as well as their draft and what they think that they should focus and, and pinpoint is, is what they want to go for. Which sounds amazing. So cool. I, I would It would be really cool to be on one of these teams. They would immediately, super fun, yeah. they would kick me out because I would be terrible, but it sounds really cool. That's what I was going to say. It'd be fun to be the fourth guy who just benefits from everyone else's uh, work practice. And yeah. <laughs> and I will practice, but I think that my conclusions will not, they usually muddy the water and not be helpful. And then they won't invite me back next time is probably what would happen. Yeah. So Zach recommended auras. Mm -hmm. It's puzzling. Uh, it's not you know, even... Auras is clearly terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why we're listening to him. Uh, he's telling us that <laughs> Ivy is the card we should be focusing on for standard. <laughs> By the way, I tried to build that deck. It's so bad. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and Jeff told us Sacrifice was good, but he'd say that no matter what also. So yeah, we didn't so... get a lot of value add from these teammates <laughs> these two guys <laughs> uh with that being said if um you want to be a part of our team for uh uncovering tournaments right. come to our discord channel arena regulars uh, right. you can find us uh, just jump on in there we'll, we're looking for applications for our uh, testing team that's right we're unsure whether to uh for our next event uh whether to play sacrifice or auras so you need to uh, to weigh in that's not true i'm not playing auras for the next event get out of here um <laughs> that's right. I'm a different tempo deck i'm my playing bad. a different tempo deck uh anyway so yeah i think from what i've been reading it seems like standard um esper is still good like we were talking about before that you know you want to like you were saying you want to play counter spells you want to play these white threats and shieldred that's your favorite card. Um, Most overrated card of all time. But still really good. But but in reality, it's just a little bit overrated. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good card. Uh, the people were, just like hyperbole. Yeah. The people thought was really shit, and then people thought was amazing. And it's just a good card. And so that seems to be the deck to beat. So I'm interested to see what our players are going to bring to the table, how many people are just going to dive into that and just try to build some secret tech into their Esper decks that is going to be um, for the mirror matches. 
or if they have something, cr- some crazy brew they've been working on. So that's why I was curious how long they've known. If they if they knew ahead of time, we're going to see interesting stuff. If they didn't, there's almost no way you don't just go with a last minute like black mid range deck because you just don't have the time to like f- figure out the new format. You've mm-hmm. only this format's only existed for like two weeks at the time you have to submit your deck list. Maybe even one. I don't know when they had to submit. But it's like I think they I think it was literally like today. Uh, we're recording. Right, okay, so two we- two weeks. Yeah. So you're not gonna while you have all this other stuff to figure out. That's part of the reason Black Midrange is still so good is because people are like, well, it's not like my deck sucks now that Meat Hook's gone. Why would I, you know, investigate all these new other options? I can just play Esper or whatever, and I know that it's still, still going to be good. Yeah. So they're like, I don't think the Meat Hook Massacre ban just wasn't enough to shake up the pot. I think it it wasn't, or it wasn't. An, let me rephrase. I I don't think that it wasn't enough to shake up the pot in terms of like a, actual card availability and what you can and can't do now. It wasn't enough to shake up the pot in terms of I'm not incentivized to go try all this other cool stuff because this deck's still good. Um, so we could still see if some people were like, or maybe even anticipated the ban and knew like, okay, tokens or something. So I'm really curious to see what this ends up looking like. It could go either way, where it's all just the same decks. Or it's like, you know, people have actually spent some time to figure out the new format, and we see new decks. Um, I think that's really cool. One thing I will say is there was a standard challenge on MTGO recently. Um, And so I think the Metagame Mentor, great article if you want to go read it, Mm -hmm. but... I think it's published before these results came out because it cites Esper as the deck to beat. And the metagame challenge clearly shows that Jund is the deck to beat. Jund was like, in two subsequent big tournaments, Jund was like 12 out of the top eight, like in each, so top 16 between both tournaments, like 12 of them were Jund midrange. It's not quite the Jund midrange deck we're used to. It's a little edited like it's just a mid-range deck it does the black red cards that are good but then it has like workshop war chief and unleash the inferno place burn down the house to deal with big boards that seems to be the deck that's like everywhere and the other big change from the challenges is that five color cami war Mm -hmm. has been doing well um and so that deck i don't know like i don't love the idea of that deck uh, I also it's just like I don't understand how you beat negate, but mm-hmm. uh, otherwise it seems fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, sure, being able to play leyline binding is really great, um, but mm-hmm. I don't. It's a cool deck. Yeah, it, it definitely is cool. Um, <laughs> it just it's not. I'm much more interested in like the blue tempo deck, like I've talked about before, or even um, some of the other uh five color decks or or playing naya enchantments or if i'm going to play something more wacky i don't know for whatever reason the uh the kami war is just a little too flashy maybe i'm not, it's, i can't do it i'm not i can't do it yeah so it depends um could see this go either way i wouldn't be surprised if you see junt as the the most played deck instead of esper because mm-hmm. i i think this junt deck would have the edge against the esper deck where their counter magic's just not that good, um, and your cards are just better on a one for one basis, and then I think the burn down the house really makes a big difference because Esper tends to like flood the board uh, a little bit, and this just deals with everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, unleash the Inferno is obviously you know just awesome when you huge we have whatever a, like a wedding announcement that needs it, like to be kills Rafine and then blows up wedding announcement yeah. at the same time. It's like okay, that was pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, or, uh, you know, whatever. It, it's almost always a two for one. Mm-hmm. So that's that's kind of where we're at, though. It's still black midrange is the de facto best deck. I still, like I said, there's got to be room for uh, other decks out there. It's just really hard to, like, brew a new deck when there's such a, 
established metagame because you're just going to lose so Mm -hmm. often because the other deck is tuned and yours is not. And it's hard to, like, know if you have a scrap project, like it's just a bad deck idea, or if you're just losing because the other deck has been tested by thousands of people and is Mm well-tuned and your, your deck just doesn't quite function quite right. But if you made some adjustments, it would do better. It's so hard to make that distinction because all of your data is just like, I just keep losing. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's really hard to like test the new metagame essentially. I want to see who is the player last year who, who brought their like Azorius brew that was just so out of left field that no one had seen. Um, It didn't do very well, uh, but it was really exciting to see a deck list like that. Um, Shoot, I can't remember. Yeah, he was the Japanese player that was like entirely MTG Arena, yes, trained or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think he like was just from his own metagame. I'm hey. trying to remember his name now, though. But, uh, Shoot, yeah. Um, if we find that, we'll we'll bring it up. But uh, that was really cool. So I'm hoping there might be, you know, there's 32 players. There might be one person that brings something exciting, uh, but you never know. I will say I, I'm surprised with of all the cards in in Sand right now. I've been seeing a lot of Lan and War Loam Speaker, which is the the two mana one three. That's the mana dork that also turns your lands into creatures. Yeah, just ends up being great. <laughs> it's one of those cards that I overlooked extremely, like just very during Dominary United when all the cards were coming out. It was not something I was excited sure. about, and I was like, oh wait, yeah. th- that activated ability doesn't cost any mana. Wait. This card's a lot better than I thought it was. I don't know why I didn't even... I just brushed past it completely. Yes. Uh, I'm still not sold. Mm-hmm. Every time I've played against that card, it's been bad, so I still need it to convince me. But it has been growing in popularity, so I assume that maybe it's small sample size for me. That this I've just Or the type of decks I tend to play or whatever, but I'm always just like, but this card stinks. Yeah. Uh, and then... You know, similar to the, the fine wall, I guess. Yeah. I'm gonna need I'm gonna need to lose to it once and then I'll be like, okay, I get it now. I guess I was just thinking that this card was like just complete garbage, like absolutely worthless. And um I g I don't know if I'm looking at it I as I still think that that's the it's thing. one in I just <laughs> was wondering if if it's like it's one in a green, but it's not the fucking what's the the Kirin uh enchantment why is your land of war elves cost two mana? Get that shit out of your deck. Because it turns a creature or land into a creature. It's so bad. It's so bad. It also taps but for I, any color. Uh, I'm willing to be wrong on this one. Yeah. But there was like a gruel aggro deck that was popular early on that oh, involved no. this card. No, 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 like, no. This no. makes no sense. That, well, horrible. you don't put mana... Okay. Yeah, you don't need a two mana mana dork in your gruel aggro deck. But um, <laughs> I think... In um, a, by the way, just, just to interject quickly before I forget... I think it's Noriyuki Mori. Noriyuki Mori. That's right. He was my player last year, and he didn't... The name just popped into my head, and I was like, I gotta say it because I'm gonna forget. It once is. Once we keep talking about how this elf sucks. That's absolutely... I don't think it sucks, though. I like it in these gen decks. I've normally seen it in them uh, because there's a lot of colored pips and things. But anyway, let's uh, let's move on. Let's go to Explorer. The standard. Um, yes. Because this is uh, more of a format I've been playing uh, a bit more as uh, I and Jeff are... I and Jeff. Perfect. Wonderful. (laughs) Drinking IPAs, man. Um, (laughs) Jeff and I are going to be playing in a Pioneer tournament, but I am only uh, practicing that tournament by playing Explorer instead of Pioneer. (laughs) Hilarious thing is I've been testing my playing Explorer as well, and then you posted Mm -hmm. that in the Discord. I was like, yeah. It's, it's kindred spirits. We just need to play yep. on arena. So. Yeah, so it's <laughs> like, like a... hey, all of these vital cards to my deck are not in the format. Can you think of something I could play that tests it? Yeah, a little that? bit, and then I'll this learn slight replacement. I'll like learn how to play those cards on the day. Um, that's basically what <laughs> yours was like. Spellqueller. I'm like, dude, there's no spellqueller equivalent in. I know, but so I'm playing Banned Spirits in this tournament, but I'm, uh, that's the plan. But I'm like, I, I'm not practicing with Spell Queller, which is like the most important card. So. I'll say Paolo is like the best approximation. I didn't think of that, but when you posted it, I was like, that's probably the best approximation because it's like an in, it's a three power flyer that interrupts them. Yeah. So I'm not completely off 
off my rocker. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, it, it is interesting playing the wrong format for a tournament that you're practicing for. So but I've had, I've had a different problem. Not that my cards aren't legal, but that my deck involves four Fable of the Mirror Breaker, and I want to play this tournament in paper and i'm not going to spend two hundred dollars on my fable of the mirror breakers so i know that i can't play this i can't choose this deck because like i don't know anyone who owns these cards and i don't want to buy them but arena just makes it so easy for me to play that card i'm like oh yeah liliana fable of the mirror breaker like all of my red black lands like this deck is great uh and then i'm like wait a minute i actually have to buy these cards hmm yeah, the plight of the arena player. See, this is why arena is awesome because it's cheaper than paper magic, and everyone likes to pretend it's not. I don't know why, but it really is. Fight me. Don't you get it, Zach? When I buy my Fable of the Mirror Breakers in real life, I can then sell them. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, but I could in theory. Yeah, whenever they get banned or something other, another card is better and the card is no longer any good. Then you'll sell it, and it loses all its value. Anyway. Um, hey, man. That's how I roll. <laughs> Buy high, sell low, baby. Yeah. That's how it is. <laughs> Actually, for me, it's buy all the cheapest versions of the cards and try to sell them higher and pretend that they're not actually <laughs> as bad as they are. <laughs> but long story short, we've both been playing some Explorer. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know how... Anyway, Jeff, do you want to start? Okay. Best deck is Rakdos. I don't think there's much. And I think that's true of Pioneer as well, by the way. Mm -hmm. But all right. Best deck, I think, is Rakdos. And I don't think there's too much dispute about it. It was the best deck a while ago. And then the new sets came out and all the black cards were really good. Mm -hmm. Like Liliana um, and Shieldred, I think, the, they're playing now. Yeah, although yep. I'm not 100% sold on that. But you can only play so much Kalidas, right? You can't play four, so mm -hmm. I'm fine as, like, one of them's going to be a Shieldred. But you still got your Thoughtseize, your Fable of the Mirror Breaker, all of your Bone Crusher Giant, like, all of these are strong red and black cards. Same deck as it was before, just literally got better. They cut some of the worst cards in the deck and improved them with, like, Liliana of the Veil, for example. Um... The list on the metagame mentor isn't even playing Chandra. A little surprising, um, but I think that's a metagame call if you're mm -hmm. going to cut the Chandras. And it's playing Croxa, which it depends. I don't love Croxa because I find so many people have incidental graveyard hate that Croxa ends up being like target player discards a card, which is <laughs> awful. Oh, <yeah>. um, <laughs> but, but hey, I mean, the. <laughs> This is what I've seen Croxes online and stuff too. And yeah. yeah. They're, they're rough so. when, when they're there. They're, um, I think as soon as Graveyard Trespasser became a card, it was printed. That's the thing. And, right? and a uh, Hive of the Eye Tyrant. It's just like this Crox is never going to see the light of day. Mm -hmm. Like you might make my turn a little awkward where I attack you with Hive when I didn't want to do that yeah. that turn. And maybe you have to. But is that worth it, really? <laughs> I don't know. I. It's definitely not as good as it used to be, but, uh, um, yeah, especially because black is so strong and that's the, that's the thing. It's like, it's not just that graveyard hate is incidental. It's just like black is the best color or one of the best colors you want to be playing it. Or you're going to have that matchup a lot. And especially in the mirror for this, it's just why you just, you kind of want to stay away from graveyard strategies. And that's why, again, I say that the Grease Fang decks, when you're playing these, you really want to play a Grease Fang deck that can win without the combo. Like, you want to be able to just have high card quality and and be like, yeah. yeah. You, you want your combo to be like a, oops, I won because some things happened in the right order. Great. Uh, and not all in on trying to... If you can't play Parkelion 2, then you're going to lose the game. Then you're screwed. Like, it's just not going to be great. Just play good cards. I think you need just higher card quality. So, graveyard decks, stay away from that. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, that's the perfect segue, I guess, because mm -hmm. Abzan Greece saying it's probably. I don't know. I, I am low on Grease Fang decks, but it's a big part of the metagame. People yeah. love it. You got to, it keeps you I, honest is what it is. Sure. I, so an overall thing that I think 
is that people don't play enough Cling to Dust. I think Cling to Dust is one of the best cards in the format and black is everywhere, and still nobody's playing Cling to Dust, it blows my mind. But I don't see how Grease Fang beats Cling to Dust. I just don't think it does. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I... All my decks include Cling to Dust, and I'm just like, I just laugh at Grease Fang, because I'm like, okay, sure, one mana, exile that, draw a card. Like, nice 4-3 or whatever. You're never going to resolve your combo, by the way. Like, literally never. I can do this whenever I want. Um... So, and obviously I'm playing instant speed removal. Like, it's just so hard for me to lose to Grease Fang because I have instant speed removal and then cling to dust as well. You know, this metagame challenge talking about, like, uh, Leyline of the Void? <laughs> like, just play cling to dust, man. Leyline is so expensive and is so bad, like, half the time if it's not in your opener. Like, mm -hmm. Cling to dust is always good. It draws you, it gains you life or draws you cards, whichever one you want. Uh, anyways, that's that's my like overall criticism of the format. I'm gonna make my second ridiculous bet that you're gonna see people. You're gonna see the pros bring play cling to dust. Um, okay, all right. Especially especially Reed Duke. I know that guy loves cling to dust. So <laughs> I'd be surprised if his deck doesn't in, doesn't include it. I mean, he loved rogues, and you also love rogues, so I understand why you play <laughs> yeah. cling to dust. It's a great card. It's good, um, and so I. <clears throat> I don't know. Grease Fang, like the deck list I'm looking at, it doesn't pass the bar that you just told me that this can win without the combo. Like in the meta, if you look at the metagame mentor list, it's like Stitcher Supplier, Rafine's Informant. Like how yeah. all in are we on this fucking combo? That's why I... St and it just <clears throat> folds to like instant speed removal or a cling to dust. It's like, I guess it has a Seeker's Chariot. You could win with a Seeker's yeah, Chariot. That's what I was going to say. That a Seeker's Chariot is really the, the card you want to play, but some of these other things, I don't know if this is the version you want to play, and I still think you shouldn't play Rafine's Informant. You should be playing Season Howlblade, but because um, that is a threat, and you can discard something at instant speed, uh, which is whenever you want, and that's when you want... You don't want to put your combo into the graveyard on your turn and wait their turn to do it. You'd much rather be able to do it on their end step and be like, oh, or just any moment. You're like, okay, I'm going to put my combo piece in now after you're... For sure. It's just such a better card. So um, that's that's what I would prefer. But if you're... Because it does both things. Whatever. doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, I agree with you that this specific list we're looking at here, if you're uh, doing this, um, might not be the one that you want to play with Grease Fang, but yeah. Grizzly Salvage, Corpse Churn. No can't stay like this thing's all in on the combo yeah and you're just gonna lose i don't know it's just one of those like i i would never pick this deck to be the one that's gonna win if this wins the world championship i would be like blown away yeah grease fang has always struck me as a deck that performs better against worse players and i don't mean like you know you're bad because you lost to grease fang like i lost no. to grease fang yeah that's the thing um i just mean like in a pro level event, it's one of those. It's one of those decks that is always overrepresented on like arena or in pioneer leagues on Magic Online. But then at the big time, it doesn't perform as well because it's harder to it's harder to sneak that stuff by a pro player than it is just a whatever Me. person on the ladder who's just looking to get to the next game. If you grease fang them yeah. or whatever, like all of us regulars here on arena. Um, right. I get killed by Grease Fang. Actually, not that much. I don't see it very often, so um, for whatever reason. Yeah, beyond that, I guess we have uh, Spirits. That's a deck. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been playing a lot less Mono Blue Spirits. But you, uh, but you, you could talk about uh, as Bant, uh, Bant uh, Spirits at the same time, I yeah. suppose. But. Yeah, so uh, they're, they're completely different decks, and that's the funny thing is that, like, uh, Mono Blue Spirits is all tempo-y where you want to play everything at um, flash speed, but you actually have like interaction. Uh, Bant Spirits is like a Coco deck, so everything is uh, creatures. You do have interaction, but they're all creature-based, and you can, right. for the most part, you can play them at instant speed if you have Rattle Chains or you're using your collected company, but uh, it doesn't really feel the same because you're not countering anything, and you're you have some counter spells in your sideboard uh, for control matchups, but for the most part, you're really not um, 
you're not doing that. You're hoping that your creatures will be able to do that for you. So uh, what I've been running into and what Jeff, Jeff was alluding to earlier, I was talking about on our <laughs> Discord, is that we don't have Spell Queller and Spell Queller for all of us Arena regulars. It's uh, one white blue for, a, I don't remember, um, Spirit with Flying, but it can... Um, Three, two, I want to say. Yeah, something like that. Uh, but it can... Um, Basically, it's like a Skyclave apparition, but for spells. But it gives them the spell back. So as someone's playing a spell, you can steal it for a while until it dies and it comes back. So we have that, and then Selfless Spirit is um, the other card you want, which is the the two mana 2-1 with flying that you can sack it to give your board indestructible. And those are the cards that you kind of go into. So if someone's board wiping... Uh, you can Coco into one of those two cards, hoping that you can either sack yourself a spirit to save your board or Coco their uh, cheap wrath out of the way. Um, We run into some issues with uh, Explorer because Bant Spirits is not part of the metagame because it's missing two pretty important cards that make it a deck. So uh, I've been trying to find other pieces to play instead of that just to prepare for this event. However, uh, you could play Mono Blue Spirits uh, almost exactly the same. Uh, the Pioneer version is just, like, you're not missing any cards, and so the Explorer version is what you're you're getting. Well, as we get more cards for Pioneer, this will stay fairly, fairly similar. I, I do like it. I sometimes feel like it just doesn't have enough oomph. I'm not... I can't get in enough damage sometimes. So, yeah, especially when they have a lot more. It's a lot of like one for one interaction and it's difficult to deal with some of these that the card quality of some of these Rakdos decks, you just can't. They're two for one in you constantly and you can't do a lot about it. So. Um, and you're just not killing them fast enough. Yeah, and I was going to say exactly that, uh, especially, like, uh, like Mono Blue Spirits, for sure. It's like, sometimes you just lose the game because your opponent plays better cards than you. Like, mm-hmm. individually, your cards are not that good. I mean, come on, you put Ascendant Spirit in your deck? <laughs> that actually, that card has continued to rise up on my list of, like, okay, I actually like it a bit better. It has, like, killed people. And I'm like, wow. I would have lost this game if I didn't have Ascendant Spirit. So, but you can you can have hands where you're like, oh, I have two Curious Obsessions, a Spell Pierce, and like, uh, you know, a slip out the back, and then like, well, this sucks. Mm-hmm. I have to mulligan <laughs> I this. I will do nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, or I could activate my Faceless Haven once I get to like nine lands and put all the shit on it and attack them, and then uh, lose that seems like a all t- of them. T- tough plan. Yeah. Yeah, so exactly. Card quality is a huge issue with the deck. I've never felt Mono Blue was good enough to make up for that card quality issue. I think Bant is... Bant doesn't really have a card quality issue Mm -hmm. and has a lot of the same aspects, so I think in Pioneer it's a lot more appealing to play the Bant version. I think you almost have enough to play a Bant version here. Like, you just... Your timing of your cocos is going to be different you're not countering spells so you you're more of an end step coco kind of thing like mm-hmm. they board wipe you end step the coco but uh just weird with rattle chains because sometimes you want rattle chains in an instant speed like if you're trying to coco for rattle chains ooh, it's that's a sketchy maneuver but uh yeah i, I think bant could still be a deck and explorer yeah, I just think people have sort of defaulted to mono blue. It's just not it, it's not going to show up at the world championship, right? Like no one's going to play. That's probably true. Yeah. yeah. Um there might be a Coco deck. Do we think there's going to be a Coco deck at the world championship actually? Is is that going to be a thing? I never run into it really. Yeah. Um, it, usually if I do it might be like angels, but a rarely yeah. run into or like or human, humans, someone with their weird human stack, uh, mm-hmm. abs and humans or something. Yeah, that's usually it. Yeah, but I've never been super impressed by those decks mm-hmm. because the problem with those decks is like the only threatening card they have is Coco, 
And as when you know that as the opponent, you're just like, okay, all I re- like, I'm not going to lose to them just curving out because their curve isn't that good. Mm-hmm. I'm only going to lose to them hitting a massive Coco. And when you know that, you can play really well. When Coco decks really crush you is like when they have a threatening curve out and you have to respond to it and then you just get blown out by the Coco because it's like you have to wipe my board or you're going to lose, but I'm just going to replenish it Mm -hmm. right at the end step Um, or counter it with a spell queller kind of thing. So it's like that's when you really get that one. And I feel like the Coco decks that I've played against have generally been like, yeah, Coco's awesome in your deck. But it, that's the only card that's awesome. Yeah. So, and then, like, a lot of them play Thalia, too. And then I'm like, okay, well, I don't have to worry about Coco because you, because you have a Thalia, so you can't play it. Uh, and I always find that hilarious where it's like, right, well, your turn four sucked because mm-hmm. you played Thalia on turn two and I didn't kill it because yeah. I know you're a Coco deck. <laughs> again, that's the only card I care about, so let's make that cost five. <laughs> Sorry, that's hilarious. Um, Yeah, so I I don't really, really expect to see it. But like you said, if anything, it would probably be. No, I I just don't, I don't, I don't think it's going to be a really big player. Yeah, I don't think we, I don't think we have it. Mm -mm. Um, One deck I do expect to see is Control. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to talk too much about it. But this is like the classic people love blue-white Control. Yep. People just love it. Especially pro players. Right. And to be fair, like, Teferi Hero of Dominaria is one of the stronger cards that exists in the format. Like, mm-hmm. if blue-white controls a deck, then Teferi is, like, one of the best cards in the format. It's just about, he only goes in that shell, so if, like, a slower blue-white controlling deck is not a thing, he's not going to show up. But it's like, it's a very real reason to want to try blue-white controls that you have access to to Teferi. And so people are going to try to make it work. Um, Because at the very least, Teferi's going to win you a few games. Like, he's Mm going to steal some games. So this deck can never be that bad when you're running Teferi and Wandering Emperor. Yeah. Like, just those two cards alone, you're going to win some games. So (laughs) Yeah. And we recently got Supreme Verdict added to this format, um which is a game changer. So I don't know. I've never been super impressed by it. I've played against it a few times and like, it's not like I always beat it. Sometimes I lose, but it's just, it hasn't really struck me as the, like, sometimes it just doesn't get there. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? And that's weird from a control deck where it It controls the game. It counters my early spells or it wipes my board and then counters what matters and then just doesn't get there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Oh, all right. Like you didn't hit your, Sometimes the Wandering Emperor doesn't matter that much. You didn't find it to fairy, uh, like your Shark Typhoons didn't matter that much. You just didn't get there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, which is always what I hope. Uh, it never seems to be the case, but that's what I... Uh, I feel like I always run into the Wandering Emperor on end step. Uh, you can either deal with it or not, and then they're going to Teferi the next turn, and you're like, well, I kind of wish that I dealt with the Teferi instead. Um tends to be what happens i often just leave the wandering emperor alive yeah because it's not that good against the type of decks i play usually yeah it's very good against the ones i play so i uh, <laughs> it's usually fairly bad yeah for me <laughs> um i'm like if you're gonna make a 2-2 or whatever and then maybe put some counters like that's not what your deck does so that's not that threatening mm-hmm. so i just don't attack stupidly basically and don't let you exile my stuff but yeah, you you always have to be worried about Teferi because that's the card that beats you. None yep. of the other cards in this deck beat you. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, I have to not lose to Teferi. If you're playing something like Spirits, then Wandering Emperor also beats you. That's where that's the, why the deck gets better. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Yes. Though that yeah exactly. <laughs> um, mono red aggro. Is there? It's another deck archetype that's kind of like the opposite of the Azorius control. Um, but mm-hmm. I also, I get surprised by the pro players that play this. Um, I know Riku Kumagai has played this in a few different tournaments. So I don't know if he's going to be interested in bringing this to the, the championship. But um, I just tend to think of him when I'm thinking of 
mono red because sometimes he's like the only player playing it and he does really well i do think of him as an aggro expert like Mm -hmm. i know he sort of made his claim to fame with mono black aggro when that wasn't even really a thing Mm -hmm. uh which was also sort of a like a math heavy aggro deck and that's what this mono red deck is as well it's like the old torbran plus ember cleave thing yeah Uh, and it's hit a few upgrades in historic with like kimono faces uh, Kak- Kakazan mm-hmm. uh, as just a great mono red card and the other thing of note that I'm seeing in here is like from those old school days of that deck uh, you maybe didn't have access to like Burning Tree Emissary and so obviously the Explorer version is naturally going to put Burning Tree Emissary in because it's just a, the best way to like Blush. Shit, like shit a board out. Yeah. Red egg. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes you just win because you like played a one drop and then you played two burning tree emissaries on the next turn and then you get to Ember Cleave mm-hmm. the turn after that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm really excited. Like, I like when Mono Red is in a tournament because I do like watching how it interacts with other decks. I don't enjoy watching a lot of the same types of decks deal with each other all the time. I, I do like blazing fast, like you didn't expect this one or let's, let's see how you can deal with this matchup. Um, being able to see that dichotomy is always good. Yeah. I've always said the best formats are when mono red is good, but not like dominant. Mm-hmm. If mono red is dominant, that's usually a crappy format. Like everyone has to play mono red or just, be a life gain deck or something that would beat nothing usually but could beat mono red mm-hmm. um, those formats usually suck but when mono red is good like i'm not even saying it doesn't it can't be the best deck but like it can't be the like so good that it warps everything else around it you should be able to beat it if you target it um, those tend to be pretty good formats when mono red's like tier one you always have to have it in your mind uh, but it's not like if you just don't like aggro, you can't play the format kind of thing. Those usually are pretty good. I don't know if we're there. I think Mono Red is probably tier two in Explorer. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like that it's sort of knocking on the door. It's like, hey, I'm like one really good red card away from being tier one. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I don't run into that often. And then the last thing I'll just mention, Rakdos Sacrifice. Uh, still a thing here. I think there's in Explorer... There's a few different ways you could build this, which I think is super interesting. You could do the claim the firstborn sort of old school version. I think of that as old school. Mm -hmm. And that's what they've listed in the metagame uh, article. But I wonder, like, I don't know, did people just forget about Anvil? Like, didn't it just crush the, uh, like, it just won a previous tournament where people had written it off, and now there's another tournament, and it's like, are we not going to talk about how Anvil is legal in this format too, and it's still really good and has access to Witches of Enlight? I think personally, if I was going to play Rak- Rakdos Sacrifice in Explorer, I would be exploring the uh, Anvil version before I would be exploring this sort of old school claim the firstborn version. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I think some people will bring something like this. I personally haven't found it to be that strong necessarily in explorer i don't think i've found quite the right build i think i want to make it a little lower to the ground like i don't even know if i'd play fable um let's like top out at mayhem devil then that's it um i think that might be more where you want to be and obviously get these trash blood tithe harvesters (laughs) out of the deck because that's not what the deck's about Uh, yeah for sure in in this type of one you don't want to be with, with everything that you want to do is like kind of sacrificing things blood tithe harvester is not what you want to be playing um though you do get the blood token but um i right, but that's all you get right like mm-hmm. i don't care about like sorcery speed killing an opponent's creature in this deck that's not what yeah because then you want to play um if you're if you care about the blood token you should play the um the other one whatever the other vampire um right but the one drop yeah the one drop um I, I just think that I would... You were saying you wouldn't go to the Claim the Firstborn. In my mind, this is the deck that I don't want to see because it always wrecks me because Claim the Firstborn is the card that I fucking 
I've, I should clarify, I'd have it in my 75, but I, yes. I don't think it'd be like main deck for claim. I guess like, like this for, this is a different type of, this is like the old school mayhem devil sack mm-hmm. decks. And I would still play mayhem devil and I'd probably have claimed the firstborn in, in some number across the 75. But I think you really want to be doing the anvil version of this deck and being a little lower to the ground uh, and sort of relying on the best thing you have going on is Cat Oven plus Mayhem Devil. And instead of going like weirdly halfway to mid range with Fables and Blood Tithe Harvesters, I think you should go all in on the like, I'm just playing a different game than you, and I'm going to ping you out and like chunk block your stuff. And like, that for me, that's where you yeah. play Anvils and uh, um, experimental whatever the synthesizer yeah and i've never liked unlucky witness personally i wouldn't play that card sweet all right well there you have it um that's kind of what we think about standard and explorer jeff let's get into our draft all right excited for this here we go (laughs) it's been a while it's been a year uh so as always i have the ceremonial toonie to see who's going to pick love it First, uh, how we're going to do this is we're going to pick five players uh, and just going back and forth. Uh, and uh, you get one point for each match win your player gets. If they get to the top four, you get an extra point. And if they win the whole thing, you get one extra point. Um, and the winner of the th- whole thing uh, gets bragging rights. And hopefully I will be able to brag at some point about... I have enjoyed those bragging rights, yeah. so I don't want to give them up. Yes, I, I know you have. All right. <laughs> Jeff, are you ready for me to flip the coin? Of course. You're going to call it in the air. I mean, I can tell you right now I'm going to call tails, but... I'm going to you know, call... I don't want you to influence your flipping power. Basically. Right. I will I catch it so and... Maybe I'm psyching you. I'm going to hit it on the back of my hand, so just don't get mad, because sometimes I feel like you've been mad when I do that. <laughs> Oh my god! All right, here yeah. we go. Well, it's interference. All right, yeah, unless it came up tails, then it's, it's coming. Then it's valid. Tails never fails. Ah, uh, it's heads. Oh, he flipped it on the back of his hand. Yeah, that's why. I shouldn't I have do told that. him I was, I was. I shouldn't have told him I was voting tails. Yeah. That was my All right. Mistake. So it's this is an interesting place to be, getting first pick. Uh, there are thirty-two players. Obviously, we're not even close to picking all of them uh like we were we were picking last time there are a lot of really good players in this tournament i think the person that i want to have on my team and i'm most excited to root for that's been my selection methodology as well because all the players are amazing yeah <laughs> uh is the player that won last year because obviously i want a repeat uh so yuta takahashi i'm gonna pick him to be on my team because I, 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 I love a dynasty. I'm, I'm sorry. I just, I do. So I was ready for this. And in the event that I had to pick second, I felt it was only fair that I selected Jean-Emmanuel Duprat oh. as they finished second last night. Okay, that's and, good. Uh, I also really want to root for them. Mm-hmm. So. That's, a, that's a good pick. I will be taking my, my second pick. And another player that I love to watch, and I know you also love to watch, so that's part of why I'm picking them, of course, Uh-oh. is Reed Duke. Um, yeah. yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, maybe maybe Reed's going to play <laughs> Cling to Dust. Um, I don't know. But any time I can steal a player away from you is something that I, I really enjoy. So. <laughs> All right. Well, I can neither confirm nor deny whether I was going to select Reed Duke and mm-hmm. that was my next pick. Uh, oh, I have tough. There's two I'm considering. But you know what? This person has just blown me away last year in just being consistently amazing mm. in almost every event. And they were actually an old Pro Tour champion from a long time ago and recently came back to the game and just continued displaying dominance. And so if they're still practicing as hard as they will before i think they're going to be a great pick so i'm going to select yan merkel who has just been uh, unbelievable mm-hmm. in recent mm-hmm. times. absolutely absolutely i 
I see you. I see you. I, um, for my next pick, um, this is someone who was really great in the last several years and um, did win the tournament that they were in, uh, Ely Cassis, just because he, he's really impressed me and everything he's done and being able to just like cheer for him is always good. All right. I only have two more. Oh, geez. All right. It happens fast. It happens so fast. That is who I was considering. I was between Jan and Ely. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think this is another really want to uh, watch them succeed. And this person generally brings new fresh decks that are like, it's literally a deck only they could do well with. And so I'm going to choose Shota Yasuoka mm. because I want him to do well and I want to watch him bring some crazy deck that I'm then going to try on the ladder and I'm going to get blown out. But uh, he's going to win with it. So that's that's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, he's crazy. I <laughs> uh, Shota was also on my list of, of players. So You just can't not root for him. You know? Yeah, it's really, really... Impossible. So I'm going to pick my next player. I have two different choices. And I I like them both. Uh, I'm going to wait on one of them. The other one is I want to watch their career a little bit better. I'm not going to bet on them just yet. But I will be picking Zachary Keeney because his name is Zach. And that's really important to me. Yeah, that's it's very important. I mean, he also <laughs> had an amazing season. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> All right. It's getting tight. It's getting tight. There's so many options and so few picks. You know what, though? I think this is a strategic pick, but also it's a great player. But I think I'm going to select Logan Nettles. I'm going to try to counterbalance the Reed Duke pick a little bit. I, was, I think they'll be on similar I, deck lists. I was expecting a Logan Nettles pick from you after I picked Reed Duke. Because I, I knew that if you picked Reed Duke, I was going to pick Logan Nettles. So uh, <laughs> That's right. I'm right there with you. I got it. I got it. All right. So my fifth and final pick, I wanted to pick someone who was more of a challenger and not necessarily part of the whole group of folks um, from the last few years. And this is a person that I just love following them on Twitter and hearing all of their thoughts about everything magic because I almost always agree with them. Jim Davis. I almost picked Jim because I was, but I was like, no, I could leave him to the last pick because my <laughs> thoughts were exactly the same. Uh, cool, 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 cool. Nice. Got him. Oh, got him. Ooh, that's tough. Uh,. In that case, hmm, hmm, I didn't expect to be sniped. Mm. Oh, that just actually that's the best. I love there's no one I would rather snipe than Jeff. Okay, I'm gonna turn I'm gonna turn full gear. I'm not taking a challenger then. I will take Yuki Ichikawa. Okay. Because you know what? You know what? He's been very good recently, and I know that he he likes sacrifice decks to some degree, so uh, don't mind rooting for the potential red black sack player. Nice. Well, Jeff, uh, let's just read off our players for our teams very quickly. Um, so I picked Yuta Takahashi, Reed Duke, Ely Cassis, Zachary Keeney, and Jim Davis. But, Jeff, what's your team looking like? I picked Sean Emmanuel Dupra, Jan Merkel, Shota Yasuoka, Logan Nettles, and Yuki Ichikawa. So please look at a list of players, find a friend, uh, pick a few players, and uh, watch the tournament this weekend. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Maybe put some money on it, or a beer, or something. Hey, yeah, there we go. Uh, We'll do a round. How about that? We said we weren't going to bet something, but we'll bet a round. That's, That's easy enough. A round of yeah, beers. I'm good with that. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, sure. He wants to bet now that he knows he won the coin toss. <laughs> <laughs> Classic Zach. Uh, cheating yeah. the system. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm pretty stoked for this tournament. I hope everyone out there is as well. And we are going to last call. So, as always, we're going to rate the beers we had this evening and pick the best for last. Um, our rating system is based on the tiers in Arena, 
It's uh, bronze to mythic. And uh, this has nothing to do with what tier you are in currently because, hey, everyone's in different tiers at different times. Nothing against you. Except for bronze beers, they are trash. They are horrible. You have to pour them out down the drain. Uh, you can't finish drinking them, which means they're really, that's really bad. Yeah, silver beers are macro brews or beers that just, uh, they're not that interesting. They don't have a lot going on. Gold beers are fine, but you don't really think about them very often, but you, you'll drink them if they're in your hand. <laughs> Platinum <laughs> beers are a step above that. You would put them into your hand. Uh, these are solid. You'll drink them again. Diamond beers are exceptional. You would recommend these to your friends. These are the ones that you um, bring to parties and uh, you know show up at the barbecue with. And Mythic, these are the best of the best. These are the uh, the contenders for the world championship of your favorite beer. Mm-hmm. All right, so Jeff, tonight we had two IPAs, and we have to pick which one we liked more. I think I have my pick. Do you have yours? I think so. All right, here you go. Three, two, one. Mondo. Mondo. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk Mondo. Good beer. I liked it. Yeah, that's what I have to say. Um, I think as I'm getting older, session IPAs are much more uh, my speed. Um, older as in like, <laughs> you know, the, as we've been doing the podcast. Um, something that has a lot of flavor and punch, but isn't... Approaching your fourth decade. Yeah, jeez. Um, isn't freaking like 8% anymore. I'm like, you know what? I like these 4.5s that are delicious. I can drink a bunch of them and I'm chill. I like that. Yeah, it's just, it's sort of like I'm trying to pit the session against the IPA because they are sort of different. Like they have different goals, I guess. But this, it was just very refreshing. I'd have that West Coast like citrusy appeal to it mm-hmm. that I really like. Uh, and honestly, it just went down like. I, yeah. we were halfway through talking about stuff and I'm like, oh, I'm almost done this beer. Like, I've just been, I've just been taking it down. Um, so it is a bit different, like an IPA, it's going to hit higher, harder than a West coast or sorry, than a session IPA, um, uh, session IPA is meant to sort of be relaxed, laid back drinking. But I thought that this did a better job of hitting its target mm-hmm. than the IPA did. Yeah. Um, like this was just really refreshing and chill to, to hang out with yeah i liked it with that being said uh actually no i could get more of these um (laughs) jeff where are you gonna put this i i'm on a i'm on a cusp between platinum and diamond um i think this one still landed platinum for me mm -hmm. um i think that was my i think i need a little extra like pizzazz i need a a, like to be wowed for diamond rather than like meeting You're right. expectations kind of thing it is what i was hoping uh, it was going to be um right. which was very like yeah i like it nice it's right. good it's solid but uh that's where it's staying perfect platinum for that three rocks ipa oh and i did want to say i i, I think the citrus is like orange instead of like lemon or lime and i mm-hmm. liked that i thought it was i thought it was fun yeah i don't know if i got the orange but i did get citrus so perfect um, I got like different citrus than you're used to kind of thing. And then mm-hmm. I looked at the can. I'm like, oh, they used orange zest. That's probably why. Um, nice. So I thought that was nice. All right. So three rocks IPA from second wedge brewing company. Um, this one actually, so it says that there are um, some pine notes in it. And I was getting that through almost like a grass kind of feel. There was, or mm-hmm. that like, um, it's like a hoppy taste or smell. That uh, is just very, um, it's not my favorite taste. Um, right. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever put the word pine to it, but, but yes, that was not what I was exactly hoping for. It was different, which I did like, and it does feel like I'm walking on a trail. Um, but I probably wouldn't get more of this beer. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, IPAs have the two things. They have the fake grapefruit and the fake pine. Mm-hmm. I tend to think of those as, like, different IPAs, and this one tried to do both, and I don't know that I loved it. Yeah. Uh, it. Uh, I liked... The, the beer as a whole is is good, and I, I may, I'm very excited for the other beers that we have from this brewery, 
and I want to try yeah. them. Um, but I think pine specifically isn't what I'm looking for and um, could be different for different people. But I was, hmm, I was still going to put this in platinum, but as I've been talking about it, I think I talked myself down to gold. Yeah, I think this was gold mm-hmm. for me fell short of expectations in a way where I was like, okay, you're just going to, you're trying to make a stock like IPA, whatever, that's fine. Uh, but then just didn't love it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, we have a bunch of more beers from both of these breweries to try over the next uh, few episodes. So excited to see how they keep matching up and maybe one of them we prefer over the other brewery. We'll have to find out. And so will you. But we are coming into closing time. You can always reach us at Arena Regulars on Twitter and Instagram. You may also find us on Arena itself under the username Arena Regulars Podcast, testing for a pioneer event in Explorer. Yeah. Uh, you can find me personally at Zulberg, that is Z E U L B E R G, on Twitter and Instagram to tell me why I'm using the wrong cards in my fake bant spirits deck but jeff where can they find you yeah they can let me know which fake cards i should play uh instead uh at blues Brews mtg on twitter uh, but the real way to get me if you want me to respond uh slash read your message is to join our discord channel again the discord channel uh is in the show notes so find the link there and then come message me Please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and iTunes. Follow us on Spotify and any place that you are listening to us right now. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Come to our Discord. All the things. We just love hearing some feedback, and all of that uh, helps our algorithm. So, yeah. This has been the Arena Regulars. Reminding you that certainly somebody is going to 3-0 the draft portion with Boros, and a bunch of people are going to be playing Cling to Dust in Explorer. Good night. That's fine.